Galatians chapter 3. Uh, Galatians, Paul's taken a lot of time in the first two chapters to tell us about his gospel. How he didn't get it from training, from schools, from some guy. He got it from Jesus Christ himself, from divine revelation. And he also told us that it, was, it had been tested in the past. You know, Peter tried to test him with this grace thing in Antioch, and Paul stood up for it and proved to be right. And uh, it got tested by all the, uh, all the people going to Jerusalem and having the big Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15, proven to be right again. It's, it's you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that alone, you know, nothing else saves you. And, uh, you know, importantly, the last verse of, of chapter 2, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain, you know. If it's works, if it's effort, if it's, if it's your attendance, or you going somewhere, or you doing some specific thing, then Christ's death was meaningless. It had absolutely no impact. Isn't that a shame? You know, because sometimes we feel like we need to help God out, you know, oh, and we don't. And so now in, in chapters 3 and 4, we get into the theological portion. You know, this is, this is God's word, why we believe what we believe about grace. And, uh, and then in verses, or chapters 5 and 6, it's the practical application of these things. So... We, we find these chapters to be very much to the point. Paul in this letter is very much short of words, but very powerful in those little words that he uses. So let's just read the first five verses of chapter 3. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians, what a great way, you know, to just pat people on the back and go, how you doing, dummy? You know, I mean... <laughs> It's kind of an interesting way. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you are now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? His beginning question is, who? His beginning question is, who has bewitched you? Who has done this? Someone has come along and messed with your thinking. That's what he's saying. We're all good at starting, aren't we? I mean, the new year rolls around and you go, I'm, I'm finally going to lose that 15 pounds I've been putting on. You know, and so, so you, you have this great start. And then, you know, birthday month rolls around. It's not just birthdays in our house. It's birthday month, you know. And there's, oh, you got to take all the kids out to dinner, you know, and so there's all the dinners, and then there's the cake. Everybody wants the cake. And so I make the cake, and then half of the cake is still left after everybody else leaves, and, well, you can't, you can't throw that out. It's the cake, you know? And, and by the time you're done with birthday month, now you got 25 pounds, and you, you're still going to lose 15. And, you know, it, it never works that way. We all understand that we're great at, finish, or at starting things, not too good at finishing. You know, any of you guys construction people like that? That wall's been half tore down for a month now, for two years now. You know, we lived in early American remodel for 15 years in our old house. <laughs> but, but what Paul is going to bring up is essential because this is the center of life. Your eternity is based upon how you answer this question. Is salvation of works? Is salvation of grace? Is it a gift 
Or is it a reward? How do you answer that? Because your eternity is based upon that answer. Most people, well, you know, I, I know it's grace, but I need to help out. Well, as soon as you step in and help out, grace is wiped out. We're going to get to that chapter in, in chapter 4 where he says, man, if you're trying to help God out with your salvation, you've walked away from grace. It's by faith. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. And Paul is speaking of a mindset that they have. Not that they're stupid. Not that they can't learn. It's that they don't want to engage their brain in what he's bringing up and what the truth is. They're unwilling to think it through. <laughs> Have you ever tried to get your point across to somebody who's unwilling or inattentive? Any of you guys have kids? This is why we clean our room every day. This is why we make our bed. And they're over there doing whatever they're doing, you know. And you're trying to get the point across? You ever try that? Does it work out good for you? Because it's not working out good for Paul here, you know. The light is on nobody's home in these Galatians. Do you know how to fix that condition? Because if you do, I need to know. Because I meet a lot of people that the light is on, but nobody's home. So this is speaking of their unwillingness to think, not their inability to think, their unwillingness. And because of that, it's pointing to a heart condition that they have. Do you realize that? This thing's connected to this thing. And when you shut this thing off, it's because this thing is somewhere else. It's wandering somewhere else. Who has bewitched you? That's a great word. Who has bewitched you? It's only used one time in the New Testament right here. And he isn't necessarily speaking of sorcery or witchcraft in, the, in that kind of thing. Paul's saying, it's like you guys have been hypnotized. It's, it's like somebody's taking your minds captive. And he says, who has led you in this way? Who, who has taken you captive? Who has hypnotized you into thinking this other thing? Who has, who has made you so fascinated with, with whatever they've brought up that you're running away from grace? We, we would say, what's gotten into you? Remember Galatians chapter 1, how he starts this? I marvel that you are so soon turning away from him, from Jesus, who called you in grace to a different gospel. Now he's saying the same thing. Someone has put a spell on you, you know? Someone has got you not thinking correctly about salvation, about how you get saved, about how you spend eternity in heaven. And it's leading to this point that you should not obey the truth. Isn't that funny? Isn't it interesting? These people are taking you captive, and it's so you won't obey the truth. Well, we know who it was. These Judaizers would follow Paul everywhere he went. And they were, they were Jews. Good, religious, strong, law-abiding Jews. And they would follow Paul and they would say, hey, this Jesus guy, you know, he's probably the Messiah. And that's cool. And that's great that you believe in him. But that's not enough. You, ne you need to get circumcised. You know, you need to start attending the synagogue. You know, you need to become a Jew now. And that'll, that'll make you complete. That'll, that'll fix you right up. That'll make you everything you need to do. And don't think it just happened in Galatia. It happened everywhere Paul went. And you know what? Paul comes here almost every week because we read Paul, right? We read his letters. And guess what? It's happening in Rexburg. Right now, today you will find people 
And they will come and they will say, well, that Jesus is great, but, you know, you need Jesus and the dietary laws. What? Well, you need Jesus and to worship on the Sabbath. You know, that Saturday thing, not just Sundays. Or you will find them, you know, you need Jesus and you need to dress right. You need to act right. You need to live right. You need to be right. Oh, faith in Jesus Christ, that's amazing, but you need more. If you really want to make it, you need to join us. Because only our membership counts. You need to read and believe in our scriptures and in our prophet. So it's Jesus and scriptures and prophet. You need to give your best. You need to serve the Lord. You need to work and perform out all the ordinances and principles. You ever heard that? Am I the only guy? See, I, I came out of that system. There's a reason I came out. Because Jesus said, ain't salvation there. There's salvation in faith in me. And only in faith in me. Not in works, not in effort, not in law, not in all of that stuff. Oh yeah, and speaking of rituals, you know, we got this place where you can come and do these special rituals. And then you will live in eternity with God. What? So I can do all of these things you're telling me to do, or I can just believe in Jesus Christ by faith. Why would I do all of those things? Because when we get to chapter 4, we'll find out if you do all of those things, you've walked away from grace, and there is no salvation in all of those things. You face this every day in Rexburg, Idaho. Every day. You face Galatians every day. You're face to face with it. Almost every person you walk up to, almost every person you work with, almost every friend you have. Have you been tempted, ever tempted to just give in? To just stop resisting, put your mind on the shelf for a while, and just blend in. It would be so much easier for my business. It would be so much easier for my friendship. It would be so much easier with my family. You know, because when I, when I go home, as soon as you walk in those doors, we can't talk about anything. We have to talk about weather. Or look at how the grass has grown. Because as soon as something gets semi-spiritual, you know, there's this collision, and we don't want any collisions in here, so let's not bring that up. You know, there's family pressure, there's financial pressure, there's neighborhood pressure, there's business pressure, even marriage pressure. Paul here is saying that we can become so foolish, so brain dead that we are willing to step away from God's amazing grace, how he saved us. Stop standing on faith and give in to the pressure just to fit in, just to make things easier. Just so, oh, whew, okay, I can live here now. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? We know. We know, right? It's the religious people I'm surrounded with. It's the people that are constantly talking to me. I know you've never heard that, right? I've heard that my whole life. Well, for 33 years I was, you know? And now they just look at me. What happened to you? Why? Because God told me to. Oh, he would never tell you that. To obey the truth is to believe the Word of God is the very Word of God and to know that you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and His accomplishments on that cross, period. Period. 
I just think about last chapter, chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And then the last sentence, for by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. <laughs> but you know how hard it can be to stand on that ground. Because you stand there. Paul says this, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as being crucified, clearly portrayed, evidently set forth, it says in the King James Version. It has this idea of on the billboard as you're driving into town, here's Jesus Christ and him crucified, you know. Christ has been crucified for you. It was clearly set out. In that day, it would be like a public notice. You know, they didn't have Facebook or, or iPhones or anything. So the public notices were on the main tree in town. They'd just take and put that little post up there. And everybody in that day, as they're going through the community, would walk up and read that post. What's new in the world today? And Jesus Christ is clearly portrayed there. He's crucified. Every time the, the church celebrates the Lord's Supper, Think about that. What are you celebrating? Jesus Christ clearly crucified. That's what we're celebrating. That's what those elements are. His body, his blood. It's so simple, but it's so pointed. Paul says, I don't understand how your minds have been distracted and taken captive by something else, by effort, by works, by performance, by ritual, by ordinance, by whatever it is. And can you hear the Galatians? But it's these Judaizers. They say, well, the only way to really get righteous the only way to really show God that you're up for the, the, for the thing is for you to do, for you to get after it. Circumcised and join in and work and slave and try. And it's always some man or some woman. It's someone else's insight being grafted in to God's word that ruins us, that draws us, that takes us captive. It's, it's them adding to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. It's them adding to what Scripture tells you. It's someone else claiming to be something. Oh, have you heard of me? I am so-and-so, and this is my position. You ever have an 18-year-old kid knock on your door and it says elder on his badge? Elder in what community are you? 18 years old is an elder to no one. But they give them status so you will listen. No Christian leader ever gave them authority. No biblical text ever gave them authority. It's always... Well, I was in prayer, and God gave me this, and now He told me to give it to you. The one we hear about most in our area, a, a guy, he, he went into the woods and prayed. That seems like a good thing to do. He says, the Father appeared to him, and the Son told him, hey, you know, the gospel's gotten corrupted, and I need you. I need you to spearhead this new gospel and this new move, and let's go for it. And he comes walking out of the woods, and he starts telling people, hey, God appeared to me, father and son. Anybody that's ever read their Bible should go tell them about. My Bible says no one's ever seen God. No one ever seen God at any time. And then he says, and by the way, he said that his word has become corrupted. Time out. You ever read this? Because in this, God guarantees his word from the time it was written until eternity. 
He guarantees it. So, two lies. And then he said, and by the way, he, he brought me a gospel, and he says, that's supposed to be the gospel. Time out. You ever read this? It says the gospel was once and for all delivered to the saints. When? When Jude wrote. 2,000 years ago, in the first century, the gospel was once and for all delivered to the saints. How many errors did this guy come out and just brashly say, God lied, he can't be trusted, and then do you want to believe in a God who said this one time and then he goes, oh man, I didn't see that coming. They've corrupted my word. I've got to start all over again. Do you want a God who's corruptible like that? Who, who's, I, I've got an all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere-existent God. If he says it, he's able to do it. That's my God. When he comes in, he says, my word will never fail. Did that sun come up this morning? Is it going to go down tonight? Then my word still stands. I'm going to stand on his promise, not on this other guy's promise. If you just read your Bible, none of this other stuff should affect you. Oh, there's still pressure. Still pressure to conform. But, you know, my idea of truth, their idea of truth are three different things. I don't have to conform to what you're saying or to what you're doing or to what you want me to do to be saved. I know I'm saved. Matter of fact, you should believe what I do so you too can be saved. Because Paul, the most religious guy in Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, the most religious, fanatic guy, says even I decided to believe in Jesus Christ that I might be saved rather than trust my religion. <laughs> Legalists love to come to you in sheep's clothing. They love to come to you and quote scripture to you. Oh, the word of God says, do you remember, you know, Jesus? He's in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Do you remember Satan bringing him the word of God? Oh, yeah, he did. Hey, the word of God says. <laughs> That's kind of a losing battle, you know. Here's Satan looking at the living word of God quoting the Word of God to the Word of God, that's going to be a losing battle. I don't know how you... Hey, look at that. But, but Paul says legalism is foolishness, it's sorcery, and it's disobedience. Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, empty-headed. Oh, non-thinking Christians. Who has bewitched you fascinated you, hypnotized you, that you should not obey the truth. Don't let any law or anyone bringing rules and regulations and laws into your life trip you up. You are God's treasure. You're the most expensive thing in all of creation. You know how I know that? Because it took the blood of Christ to pay for you, to buy you. He tells us clearly that we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, justified, justified is not forgiven. I mean, you are forgiven, that's cool, but that's not justified. Justified is so much more than that. You can be forgiven and still have a record. Right? I mean, the governor can come to you, oh yeah, oh pardon, and give you the old pardon thing and you don't get the electric chair and you walk out of there. But anybody that looks at you, they still see your record. See, justified is there is no record. It's just as if I'd never sinned, justified. I have no record. I have no record of wrong. Now, if you know me, that should shock you, right? It should just, like, are you kidding me? That, that guy's got no record of wrong? Then I'm in, you know? Whew, that's easy. But that's crazy talk. Or that's the truth of Jesus Christ. Right? That's Almighty God at work 
on your behalf. You see, it pleased the father to lay on his son the iniquities of us all. You see, he bore our sins on that tree. So now with the spirit we now have in us, we can cry out, Abba, Father. It's the spirit of the son that's in us, right? And we get to cry out, Daddy, help me. Daddy, walk me through this. Daddy, help me with that. Dad, thanks for loving me. Thanks for welcoming me into the family. And when he looks at us, he sees no spot. He sees no wrinkle. He sees no past evidence of wrong. Now, no one's ever loved you like that in this life, right? I mean, even my mom loved me if and loved me when. And when we get saved, we struggle to bring in God's love because it's unconditional, because it's, it's beyond us. Man, I just blew it, and he says he loves me. And, and we have to walk that place. You'll only enjoy God's love when you get out of the boat and walk on it by faith, walk on that water by faith. Because just sitting in the boat, you can't enjoy it. You can kind of see it over there. You got to get out of the boat. You got to walk on love by faith. So we have this struggle. We have this tendency to listen to people who seem very smart and very religious. We have this tendency to listen to people when they come off maybe smarter than we are. But I'm just going to give you a little warning. Never listen to anybody that can explain away the Bible. If they can explain away the Bible, they're way too smart for me. Because <laughs> you can't explain away the Bible. Because God's foolishness is greater than their wisdom. <laughs> you see, we just need to learn to stand by faith. And faith is not measurable. Right? We always think we need something measurable. Well, if I got up every day this week and read my Bible and prayed, I'd get a gold star. And we want that measurable thing. Walking in faith, there's nothing measurable about it. I'm standing here by faith. <laughs> we like the idea of doing good because we can measure it. We like the idea of helping and, and being and being involved and being active because we can measure it. I did some good last week. Good for you. But it has nothing to do with your salvation. Coming to Jesus is stepping out of the boat and walking to him on something that seems unwalkable, on faith, on water. <laughs> and everything needed is provided by him not by you so verse 2 he says this only I want to learn from you did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith he says I only want to know one thing if you guys would just answer one question everything would be solved <laughs> when you got saved when you received the Holy Spirit of promise, <laughs> was that by your good works or was that by hearing the word of God, by faith? And then, verse 3, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Notice he already answered the first question. Are you now being made perfect in the flesh? And then, just to touch on verse 4, therefore for he who supplied the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? <laughs> the day you were saved, because he's going to talk about 
He's going to talk about regeneration, the day we get saved, verse 2. Verse 3, sanctification, as you go through life and all of this stuff takes place, is it by works or is it by faith? And then verse 5, manifestation, when God works in your life, is it because of your good works or is it because of faith? He's going to bring all of these things up. He's going to say, were you regenerated? Were you born again because of your good works? Or did you hear a message? Did you hear Jesus Christ proclaimed in his gospel? And did you go, I need that? And your heart cried out and you went forward or you prayed and you said, oh God, forgive me. Oh God, cleanse me. Oh God, come into this thing and fix this thing. You know, most of you guys didn't even know God came in when you got saved, right? Most of you guys were going, oh God, forgive me, help me. I'm a, I, I blow it and I've blown it and I just continue to blow it all the time. Right? We didn't even know there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit to move in and take over and do all of this stuff. Well, did that happen by works or by faith? You walked up there by faith, didn't you? I sure did. John 16, Jesus says the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and he begins to produce conviction in us. He begins to lean on us and point out things and we start looking at him and we're going, oh, I never saw that. Oh, I am a filthy sinner. Oh, Jesus died for me. And you know, you come through all that stuff and then he brings us to that place where we accept Christ's completed work for ourselves and you're regenerated, you're born again, you're a brand new being. And the Holy Spirit now moves in. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever achieves for him, hmm, doesn't say that, whosoever does all the works and the ordinances and baptism, no, no, doesn't say that. Whosoever believes, oh yeah, whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have presently everlasting life. Do you have that? Do you sit right here right now in everlasting life? Not in some limited life. Not in some going to end life. You know, in 1993 I got saved and I got then eternal life and I still have eternal life. And, you know, in 10,000 years I'm still going to have eternal life in the presence of Christ Jesus. It's not some future event. It's a right now happening. It's not because I fasted. It's not because I got baptized. It's not because I got circumcised. It's not because I joined an organization. <laughs> I came to Christ by faith. I remember it. I remember sitting in the back of that auditorium and hearing that guy say that Mark could be forgiven and Jesus had already paid for him and Jesus was willing to accept me into his family and I, I wanted to run down front. I looked at Brendan and said, you going? Because I'm going, you know? I think we should go because I need that. I'm pretty sure you do too, you know? She was a, she was a sinner. You, I could tell you stories. <laughs> Now, Paul will speak of the Holy Spirit now 18 times in the next four chapters. 18 times because his work is essential, essential in our lives, in the lives of believers. Our new birth was not from keeping law, not from keeping regulations, not from doing specific things, but simply obeying the conviction of the Holy Spirit and saying, I need that. And then in verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish? Have you begun in the Spirit, or having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Are you now so non-thinking, so non-engaging your brain, that you set faith aside and you bring works forward, and that's how you think 
you're sanctified. That's how you think you, you walk towards God now in this saved life. If you had a supernatural beginning, anybody in here not have a supernatural beginning? God just stepped into your life and said, you're mine today. You know, anybody ever not have that? Because I don't know anybody who that isn't, that's a supernatural beginning. If you have a supernatural beginning, you must have a supernatural continuance. It's the only way. God leads you from then on. God draws you through and drags you through and, and brings you through. <laughs> Many times we, we cool down. You know, when I first got saved, I, was, I, I may have been just a little bit on fire. I was reading and praying and studying and doing all that stuff. I'd go out to work and I would drive those poor guys crazy. I'd just walk up to them. Hey, I just read this in Isaiah. Do you realize the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll? Do you, do you think that's like one of those blinds that the teacher had in grade school, you know, with the big map on it? She'd go over there and start pulling and, you know? And those guys would look at me like, what? It says right here in Isaiah. And then I'd lead them from Isaiah to Jesus, you know, and salvation somehow. And they're like, get away from me. That's a crazy guy. He actually believes the Bible. I don't know what's going on. I would, I would have people captive for four, six hours a day. They would be sitting in a room with me, sometimes just a little eight by eight room, and there's two of us in there watching a bunch of monitors. <laughs> It's going to be fun, you know? But then I matured. You might spell that manure. I mean ma matured. And I stopped being so fanatical, you know. Calm down. It's okay. It's not okay. You shouldn't calm down. You should be excited still. And we, we begin to think that we're in a co-op with God. God's doing his part. I'm doing my part. We're all going to get there together. It's going to be okay. You're not in a co-op. We go to church and we go, oh, man, not that song again, Ron. Ron, I'm getting tired of that song. Oh, man, not that song. Pick a new song, buddy. You know? We go there and we go, oh, don't ask. Here, here she comes. Don't ask her. Don't ask her how she's doing because she'll tell you. You'll be tied to her for the next two hours. You won't be able to get away. Don't, don't go over on, on that side. Sorry, I didn't mean to point to that side. But don't go over by that side. You know, there's that one guy over there. And, man, he took a bath in 93, I'm pretty sure. You know, but I'm not sure he has. And there's... His breath, oh man, it'll knock you over. Isn't it funny how we go from just, man, driving people crazy and loving everybody to suddenly we're like, this isn't working out the way I want it to. These guys are a bunch of jerks. Isn't it funny how we do that? We call that maturing. That's not maturing. That's manure. You're in the wrong patch, you know? The truth is, yeah, I've sung all these songs. But you know, every once in a while, those words just pop off that screen and just convict my little heart. I've read through the Bible, I don't know, 35 times. Some of you guys are going, Mark, I can't even get through it once. It's just not speaking to me. Try 35 times. And yet, you know what? Every time I go through it, it speaks to me. Every once in a while, there's that verse, you know, you're reading through, and th that verse is like, we're doing this thing, you know, and you finally get to it, and you read it, and you're like, ah, I better hurry and pass on, you know, <laughs> it's still speaking to me, things are still happening. I've heard pastors teach my whole Christian life, yet I still listen to them teach and preach, because they still get me. The truth of all this is, 
the Spirit is still at work in my life. Whether I acknowledge Him or not, He's still poking me, prodding me, drawing me, doing all of these things. God should be growing in us, not lessening in us. You know, if you look around and, and you got some people in here you don't want to talk to, you got some people in here you don't want to sit by, you got some people in here you don't want to say hi to, you got some, some songs that we're singing that you don't like, it's not the song's problem, it's not the person's problem, it's your heart's problem. <laughs> I want to be as excited as I once was. Only better, you know? Our experience today is as supernatural as our beginning was. You know, I am just as desperate today for God to show up and do something amazing in my life and hold on to me and keep me as I was the very first day I got saved. The very first day. I'm as desperate for his word to pop off that page today as I was the very first day I read through that page. You know, and, and we have the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. He's been given to us like an engagement ring. Arabona is the word in the Greek. It's like the engagement ring. And the wedding's coming. Jesus Christ is returning. He's coming back for us. We should, you ever seen a girl the day after she got a ring? You ever see one just hide it? What happened? Oh, nothing. No, you don't see that, do you? What do you see? You see that glint. It's like, get that thing out of my face. What is that? She is, look, look I'm engaged. I'm going, I, I, this thing, I got the guy. And, oh, oh. and you're thinking it's contagious. Get away from me. How come we're not that excited? Because we've been given the engagement ring. The guy's coming. We've got the best groom in the world. Verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain if indeed they were in vain? You remember what it was like when you got saved and you were just brash enough and bold enough to just start sharing your faith with people? Talking about Jesus, talking about spiritual things. Driving people crazy. I do. And I took some heat over that. Guys didn't want to work with me. Guys wanted to be separated from me. Guys, <coughs> guys would read me the riot act when <coughs> every radio station in the next vehicle was set to only Christian stations. Drove them crazy. Because religious people can get a little mean. You ever run across the mean side of a religious person? They hear you get saved because you're sharing it. They hear you get saved and they're looking at you and they've watched your life maybe the last 10, 15, 20 years and they know you and they, alcohol and drugs and girls and you know, <coughs> here's your life and here's their life. I've been going to church my whole life. We got a whole, whole row that's just us. I've been, I've been paying I've been praying, I've been attending, I've been serving, I've been doing everything they ask me to do, and now here you walk in. And you're like, pray Jesus, I, I accepted him as Lord and Savior, now I'm going to heaven, and you think you're going to heaven, and you actually think I'm not. And I, was, I, I like to stop him right there. You're right. That's exactly what I've been trying to get across to you. Why, oh, you're just arrogant, you're a jerk. Well, I'm not arrogant, I'm just right. Sometimes arrogantly right, sorry. But I'm just right. Because it's not your attendance. It's not you being there the whole time. It's not all of that stuff you do. It's, it's do you know? <coughs> and have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know you're going to heaven? Can you raise your hand right now? I'm going to heaven. Here, here's the thing. Why am I going there? Because Mark's such a good guy and he's up there teaching. That's why I'm going. <laughs> anyway, I'm going. I'm going because Jesus Christ died on that cross for me. 
And I've accepted everything he, about what he accomplished there. And I'm walking it out, standing on faith. He says, man, you guys went through some stuff. You suffered some things. Were they in vain? Really? He says, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Is he who supplies and ministers, is that continually going on, continually supplying, continually ministering, because that's the Spirit's job in your life, right? It's not a one-time deal. You don't just get saved, I get the Spirit of God back in 93. What's he done lately? You know, it's kind of like in a rock band. It's only your latest hit that anybody pays attention to, right? What have you done lately? Uh, he's a one-time wonder. Off he goes, you know. Any manifestation, any words coming off the page, any voice, any word coming off of that thing, anybody coming up to you and convicting you just by a couple of words, you know, all of that stuff is light, right? Anything that brings conviction makes manifest is light that's the Holy Spirit doing working in your life now he's doing that because you're keeping the law right no he's doing that because you're walking by faith Luke eleven thirteen, one of my favorite passages ask seek and knock you know and he says if you being a, a evil parent a fallen parent a, a even know how to give your kid breakfast when he asks for breakfast, how much more will the Father give the Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, that doesn't happen at salvation. You remember salvation. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You cried out for His help. You had no idea that Spirit was even out there. This happens after salvation. This is, as we're walking through this life, we go, man, I need something more. I need more of you. And so we cry out, Father, help me. And what's he do? He gives you more of the Spirit. We see our world falling apart today, don't we? Anybody blind enough not to look out there at the world and go, man, this world's in some trouble. You know, all kinds of stuff going on. Three major earthquakes in South America, you know, Mexico in three weeks. Two big hurricanes, you know, there's the biggest drought going on in the, ever in East Africa. Tens of thousands of people dying because of lack of water, lack of food. India, floods. What was it, over 10,000 people died in these floods? You hear anything about that on the news? It's so interesting to me. We don't hear any of that stuff. Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking, oh, Lord Jesus? You know, it's feeling like the last days. I'm not a prophet. I'm not telling you it's the last day. Well, yes, I am. Um, we're living in the last days because we know the last days are from the death of Jesus Christ till he comes. So those we're all in the last days. But I think we're closer than we've ever been to the last days because, well, nobody's lived beyond the day. So, you know, here we are. Understand this, no other part of the world is as spiritually dark as the part of the world you stand in today. Do you understand that? Can you find any other place that's more than 98% something? The darkest spiritual place on the planet is where you live. Is where God has placed you at this specific time for a specific purpose. <laughs> they think they have all the answers. They think they're on God's side. And that's what makes them so tough to engage their brain because they've already shut it off. And we need them to wake back up to actually engage the brain and find out that God doesn't accept works. God doesn't accept your effort. 
God doesn't accept your dress. God doesn't accept your tithe. God doesn't accept your, your works, your ordinances, your principles. He doesn't accept any of that. What's he accept? A humble and contrite spirit that's come to him and says, Lord, I need you. That's what he accepts. You know, we need to pick up this book. We need to read it. We need to get on our knees and pray. Not just for us, but for those around us. We need to let the Spirit lead us as Christians through this life into all knowledge, all truth. You know, I don't believe everybody in this town's meant to stay the way they are. Because God moved us here on purpose. God orchestrated us moving right here to this little square. I don't know why. It's weird to me. Why would he place us right here, right now? Because he's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And we need to be just dumb enough to ask, what do you want to do with us, Lord? Why us? I mean, we were created specifically for this time. We were created specifically for this reason. And we were placed specifically right here. Hmm. What do you got going on, Lord? You want us to start sharing the truth? You want us to stand on faith? You want us to be the oddballs in this community? Maybe he does. Just, just thinking. Paul says, I only want to know one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by works or by faith? Because that answers the entire question. Grace or works, law or faith. It answers everything right there. Oh Lord, do we need a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, don't we? Wouldn't it be amazing to just have a Pentecost experience and just get filled again, filled afresh, on fire again for the Lord? Are you crying out for that? Are you asking him for that? Because we need that. I'm desperate for that. Would you, if you're not going to pray for you, pray for me? Because I need it. We need a real move of the Spirit of God in this place. Does that happen by our works, by our effort? No, it happens by faith. Are you praying that God would wake people up? God would be drawn people? God would be, you know, just giving us opportunity and brolems, rub shoulders with somebody and... Oh, Lord bless you. What do you know about the Lord? Well, let me tell you what I know about the Lord. Next thing you know. Is it a reward? Or is it a free gift? When you settle that, then stand on that. We must be willing to take all of our education all of our thinking, all of the way we grew up, everything that is us, and submit it to Jesus Christ and to his word. We must be willing to take everything we've ever learned. Imagine that. All of these higher educated people around. I, I never got through that. Higher education to me was <sighs> higher education. You know? <laughs> Sorry, bad example, but... Can you imagine being a PhD and then taking your PhD and laying it at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, it's for you. All this education is for you, Lord. How do I use it for you? Lord, all of this life experience that I have behind me, I lay it at the foot of your cross and I say, Lord, it's for you. How do you want me to use it? Lord, all of my background, all of my earning, all of my learning, all of me, I lay at the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, come and use this thing. However you can use this thing, 
Let's go do that. Paul says one thing is essential. Know where you stand. And if you're standing on solid ground, you're not standing on faith. Sure, there's the solid ground of the word. This world doesn't call that solid ground. Well, you Christians, you believe almost anything. You still believe in a, in a make-believe God that is invisible, that everywhere existent, that's all-powerful, that controls everything. Well, if he's a good God like he says he is, how come this and how come that? You've got to stand there by faith, don't you? Yeah, you do. You know, faith is very important to God. It says it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please him. It's impossible for you to put a smile on God's face if you're not standing in faith. Hmm. Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish church. Oh, foolish pastor. Right? Who has bewitched you? Who's drawn the, the, the sheet over your eyes so you're not paying attention, you're not looking at all the facts? Because here's the facts. Jesus Christ, God the Son, took on flesh and he came down here and dwelt among us. He walked out a perfect life, fulfilling the law. At the end of his life, he goes to that cross and they nail him to that cross. And on that cross, it says when he's pinned onto that cross, the Ten Commandments are pinned to that cross. The law is pinned to that cross. It dies with him for a Christian. And on that cross, the Father pours out all of his holy wrath that you deserve. Every stupid, rotten, ugly thought, ugly thing you've ever done was paid for on that cross in those three hours of darkness. And when Jesus comes out of that three hours of darkness, he, he gets a little drink and he cries out with everything that's in him to tell us that. He cries out, it is finished. All those works you want to do to get to heaven, already done. Everything that ever needed doing for you to get to heaven, is done. It's finished. Paid in full. Well, what do I do now, Lord? Just what he told that guy in the Gospels. What must I, what good works must I do, you know, to enter heaven? You must believe on Jesus Christ. That's your good work. Believe. Stand there in faith. Father, I love this book. I love this book because I came out of religion and and I came out of this foolishness and I came out of this unthinking place to a place where, man, every day I'm kind of unsure. Am I standing here in faith? Uh, uh, should I go do that? Should I go do this? And Lord, it, it feels unmeasurable, so I, I get nervous. But Lord, what I've learned to understand is when you lead me, when you direct me, when you guide me, truly that's what I should be about. And when you don't, Lord, I just sit there in your presence and am in wonder of the fact that you would so love me, that you would so give yourself for me. Lord, you're, you're amazing. Your grace is amazing. And God, we just, with one heart and one accord, say, Lord, thank you for our salvation. Lord, we praise you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do through the Spirit of God in us as we walk out this sanctification process. And God, with unity, we ask you, Lord, if you need us, when you need us, and when you want us, Lord, knock on our door. Direct us, lead us, and provide for us in your amazing way, in your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.